Senator Jason Barrett, Vice Chair of GovOrg, and he also serves on the Finance Committee as well as others, too. Jason, good morning to you. Thanks for being with us. Always a pleasure. Good morning. So let's get right into it. Uh, yesterday, the governor was on this program. He had his tour in West Virginia's uh, eastern panhandle city of Martinsburg, where he spoke uh, and took questions from a packed uh, room at the old courthouse there. And I would say the majority of the people who spoke seemed to be against the tax cut. Now, I, I'm going to generalize and say, on average, this was an older community. I, I'm going to presume retired or close to it, and uh, they wanted money spent more on services and fixing things in the state that need fixed, and uh, seemed to be opposed to the tax cut and the future problems it would cause should the economy turn. Jason, can you address some of those concerns? Well, I think that that's why last week, uh, when when you folks asked me questions, that I mentioned about prioritizing some of the spending. Now, I'm I'm certainly in the camp that the things we need to do a significant tax cut. Uh, but I also uh, am aware of, of, of a lot of things that we have to invest in in this state uh, moving forward. So it's a balance. It's weighing one against the other. Uh, and that's why the Senate's in no rush to, to pass something out uh, just yet. But I'm absolutely uh, in support of, of a large tax cut. The other concern was that a sales tax would be enacted to offset the loss of revenue. The governor... And John Hardy and Eric Halsolder, who were with the governor yesterday, uh, as well as Revenue Secretary Dave Hardy, all said no tax uh, sales tax increases off the table completely. Uh, it's not coming from the House. And he thought of it coming from the Senate side, Jason. Well, I think it's possible. I think it, it's on the table. Um, you know, I think that what you all have reported and, and what I think some of my colleagues on, on both sides of the of the building have stated that one possibility is a 50 percent. Uh, immediate personal income tax reduction with a uh, a two percent uh, increase to the consumer sales tax. Um, there's there's nothing that says that sales tax increase has to be permanent. Uh, a thirty percent reduction in personal income tax uh, is about seven hundred and fifty million dollar tax cut to the people of West Virginia. Uh, if you do it the other way and do a fifty percent now and a two percent increase on consumer sales tax, uh, that is also a seven hundred and fifty million dollar tax cut to the people of West Virginia, uh, because each percentage of consumer sales tax brings in roughly $250 million. The only thing that I would point out uh, is that 20% of consumer sales tax collected in West Virginia is paid for by out-of-state residents. Uh, all personal income tax in West Virginia uh, is paid by West Virginia residents. So uh, the folks that call this a tax shift or uh, not as much of a tax cut. Uh, their calculators evidently work differently than the rest of ours. Hold on, hold on a second there, Bill. I don't have your microphone up okay. just, yeah. <laughs> just yet. One of those, uh, Jason, is the governor, and the governor came out very clear that he does not. He's not in favor of shifting from one tax to another tax. Well, it's not a dollar for dollar shift. Um, I, look, the two percent sales tax increase sounds far worse than it really is. Again, it's $250 million uh, for each point uh, on consumer sales tax. A 50% reduction in personal income tax is about $1.3, uh, $1.25 billion. So again, it's, it's the same uh, dollar amount that, that would be reduced uh, from the state's general revenue budget, and it would be uh, still a large tax cut to West Virginians. And you can argue that it's actually a larger tax cut to West Virginians because again, 20% is paid by consumer sales tax, is paid by out of state residents. In regards to the future surpluses the governor's office has projected uh, over a billion dollars each year for the next three years, and in regards to the economic claims of what a 50% tax cut would do, Delegate John Hardy yesterday said the numbers we are projecting right now are not based at all on dynamic scoring. And that means they're not assuming any cause and effect from the tax cuts when they come up with these surplus numbers for the next three years. Jason, do uh, does the Senate's numbers reflect the same? Well, the governor sets and the Depart revenue department set uh, the revenue estimates. Um, how they score that is, is up to them. They don't necessarily share that with us. Uh, but these revenue estimates for the next several years also make very large assumptions that severance tax is going to continue down the path 
that it is. And it is uh, incredibly volatile. Things that happen overseas in Russia to affect the, uh, the, the price and the demand of metallurgical coal. Uh, gas, uh, you know, severance tax is, is, is up right now. There's no guarantee that that's going to continue to move forward. Um, again, I think we're, we're all kind of, uh, you know, looking at somewhere around $700, $750 million tax cut. I think that's, um, I think that's certainly doable. Uh, you know, again, the, the, what the position the Senate has taken is that we see 140, over the past couple of decades, we've seen $140 million growth in the state's budget every year. Now, we've seen tremendous growth in the past several years, but $140 million is, is that number over a couple of decades, and that's the safe number with having these um, four years of flatline budgets has built in, you know, near $600 million uh, that's, that's safe to be able to cut, uh, and that's kind of built in moving forward to allow these tax cuts. Jason, uh, previously, and you, I think you've done a, a, a nice job of, uh, of providing some due process, what the Senate's trying to do. Due process notwithstanding, economics notwithstanding, and I've raised this point a couple times today, the Republicans have run on the fact of a tax cut. The House and the governor have already endorsed a significant tax cut. Convince me that the Senate is not in a, uh, is not being pressured to mimic what the House and the governor said because of the p- political realities. I mean, we're, I, I don't think there's any pressure from the House or the governor. I mean, they they may they may attempt to apply pressure, but I'm not. I'm not sure how successful they'll be at. Are you talking about pressure from them? Are you talking about pressure from outside? Where, where you, where I'm talking about pressure? I'm talking about pressure which you and others have introduced to yourself. You've said we have to have a tax cut. We're going to have a tax cut, and uh, and uh, and the fact that the the governor has picked up on what the Senate, some of the Senate have said they would like to have, and he said this all the time: a 50 percent tax cut. So the governor and the House have done basically what they've interpreted the Senate to have asked them to do. With that been the case, how can the Senate not go along with a 50% tax cut at this point in time? The, the Senate has never asked for a multi-year personal income tax reduction. The, the, the Senate has been very clear to both the House and the governor that if we did a 50% personal income tax reduction, that it needed to be done in one year to get the economic benefit that comes with personal income tax rates that low. That was a plan that was uh, last year when we were dealing with tax cuts, I was a member of the House. Um, when the Senate was pushing the personal property tax reduction, uh, the House didn't want to, well, let me rephrase that. Some in House leadership did not want to take that up. A lot of members did. Uh, and then when, when it was clear that the House was not going to take up that personal property reduction, the House sent over or the Senate sent over an idea of a 50% tax reduction, personal income tax reduction in one year. So it's very clear to everybody here uh, where the Senate has been on the 50% reduction. It has never been a multi-year approach. Yeah, but the House, uh, Eric Householder said the other day uh, that they would gladly do a one-year 50% tax cut. So that should not be an issue. Okay, that, and that's $1.25 billion to do that, and the governor just increased his general revenue budget by $248 million and then put a billion dollars of surplus spending in the, rev, in, the in the surplus section of the budget um, that is base building, and many of which are not, are not one-time expenses. We have to go through this $1.3 billion in the general revenue surplus section of the budget to figure out what's uh, important and what we need to prioritize. Uh, I, I think Chairman Householder has said that, that uh, the Senate has asked uh, the House and the, and, the, and the Governor's Office to, to prioritize all of the spending so we can get on the same page uh, so that we can spend money appropriately and, and leave enough money for tax cuts. I'm not so sure that either one of those two bodies have done that yet. I mean, the, 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 I don't believe the House and the Governor's Office has provided um, their prioritized list. I'm sure they're working on it. It's only day 20 couple. We, we certainly have time. Uh, one of the other problems uh, that I dealt with in committee yesterday uh, was the Division of Corrections, who uh, have over a thousand vacancies, uh, and in the governor's budget, 
has a $2,700 raise to correction workers. Now, there is some locality stuff, uh, locality pay bill, uh, or a portion of that put in for the Eastern Panhandle, which is great. I appreciate the governor's uh, support of that. I, I applaud him for that. He deserves credit for it. We're, we're pushing for that. But that may help us a little bit in the Eastern Panhandle with some of that locality pay. But when you have over 1,000 vacancies across this state, $2,700 pay raise isn't going to fix that problem. We're going to look at trying to do a larger pay raise if we can get that done this year, uh, but it's going to have to be done uh, sometime very soon. We're paying the National Guard uh, millions of dollars uh, to staff uh, some of our uh, correction facilities. We're paying people overtime. We're losing people all the time. It costs $15,000 to train a correction officer, and the governor puts in his budget $2,700 across the board pay raise. Um, that's not going to get the job done. That's not going to fix that problem. So if, if that's a problem the legislature is going to take on now, and we're going to pass significant pay raises for correction workers, that's not built in the governor's $4.8 billion budget uh, that already has $248 million in additional spending over last year. So that's why the Senate's not in a hurry. We, we have these other problems that the governor is not addressing in his budget. Uh, that, that we recognize the House is paying. They're they're moving forward with pay raise bill after pay raise bill, um, and I assume they're all going to come over here uh, to the Senate. And we're going to have to prioritize what's the most important. Is five percent across the board the most important? Probably not. Uh, probably what's more important is identify uh, areas where we have critical need for employees and address those issues, similar to the way we did with the state police last year. Yeah, Jason, I'm going to try to simplify this, at least in my way of thinking. So uh, there's two approaches. One, you could look at expenses first and what's left over. Then you look at the uh, uh, the tax cut that's switch on the revenue side. Or, and I think that's kind of what you're proposing. The other way is to look at the tax cut first and then whatever is available, then you address the expenses. And that's kind of what I'm hearing from the governor and the House. At the end of the day, it's all going to get done. So you can, you can look at one first and the other. I don't think it really too much matters uh, at the end of the day. Uh, you have to have a balanced budget. Um, you need to provide tax relief to people of West Virginia, uh, and you need to pay uh, for the essential services of government. Maria. So, Jason, um, uh, we talked with Delegate Hornby um, earlier about the – House Education Committees, and you just made reference to this, the 20% pay increase for teachers and service personnel. Um, are you going to go along with that? Is the Say Senate, that again. Uh, it's a 20% pay increase that the House Education Committee. Um, starting pay. Starting pay. 20% increase to the starting pay of someone just uh, out of college starting as a teacher. Right. What's that called? I mean, <laughs> that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. That, I mean, I have no idea what that, uh, what the fiscal note on that is. It's a lot, I can assure you. Um, but again, here's that is on top of the governor's budget at 4.8 billion, which is 248 million above last year. And here's more spending that's that's moving forward. And we're trying to do this tax cut. And everybody wants to know why we're not doing this tax cut right now when they're passing pay raise after pay raise and millions and millions of dollars. Okay, I think you answered my question. So let me let me follow up something along a different vein. So we've been talking about this tax cut. It's you know certainly top of the fold every day in uh, local media. Um, the growth in the state budget. West Virginia continues to lose population, and some argue that that a tax cut is not going to do anything to to help in that regard. What's your thought about that? Is a tax cut going to bring people here in droves, or are there other things that we have to do in addition? Some people say that it's not going to do anything. So what, what's your thought about that? Well, I think if you look across the country right now uh, of states gaining population and states losing population, if you look at uh, states like Tennessee, North Carolina, Florida, uh, you look at states like that who uh, have a tax policy that is very friendly uh, to the taxpayers and working people of their states, you're seeing a, uh, an increase in population. If you look at states with, uh, and Texas is included in that as well, and you look at states that uh, have 
that are not friendly to taxpayers, California, New York, much of the Northeast, they're losing population. So, you know, West Virginia actually has a net migration in the past couple of years. Our, so we have more people coming in than we have leaving. Our problem is we have an older population who are passing away and not, and not enough uh, babies are being born. That's how we're losing population. We actually have a net migration of people moving, more people moving in than moving out. Uh, so I, I think tax policy uh, certainly is a driving factor in where people locate and relocate. Uh, and so I think a large tax cut uh, will drive people to the state. Okay. Senator Jason Barrett, our guest here. Jason, let's talk about a couple of the bills that you've got uh, moving through in pending status right now, one of which catches my eye because it has those three words, certificate of need, with an SB 528 requiring certificate of need to be subject to legislative rulemaking. Tell me about that, please, sir. Well, it's a kind of different uh, approach that I'm taking on CON this year. Now, I certainly uh, am supporting of CON repeals. Uh, obviously, I know you have uh, the hospice team there, so uh, I would, if we go down the CON path of repealing that, I'm, I'm sure hospice would be protected before we before we go down there. But uh, the, the bill that you're talking about uh, actually uh, puts the uh, rulemaking review under uh, the legislature, so that uh, when CO when certificates of need uh, are, are uh, decided upon that the legislature uh, would have some say over that and, and some rulemaking uh, over over that to, uh, to um, allow some of these certificates to be awarded. Okay. So it's kind of a an, an alternative plan to repealing CON. Okay. Uh, also SB 483 relating to taxation of gambling and lottery winnings. Yeah, that one's uh, unique. So the, the way that it works in, on your federal taxes, if you win, uh, if you gamble and you win, let, let's say you win $100,000 and you lose $50,000, you pay uh, income tax, federal income tax on 50000 because that's your net proceeds. In West Virginia, uh, if you spend hundred, if you win 100000 lose 50000 you pay uh, income tax on the whole $100,000. In a lot of cases, uh, you know, you, you look at, at a lot of the um, the, the LVL, which is limited video lottery, uh, places across our community. Uh, once you hit the twelve, if you hit twelve hundred dollars in one spin on a slot machine, you pay personal income tax on the whole twelve hundred. Now you could have just lost twelve. You could have lost two thousand dollars and just hit one spin to win twelve hundred, and you're eight hundred dollars in the hole, and you're going to pay income tax on twelve hundred dollars to the state of West Virginia. It's unfair. I think. Uh, the people that, uh, that the thing that concerns me about the way we do it now is that we are are almost incentivizing uh, folks to gamble uh, offshore uh, and illegally mm -hmm. uh, because they know, hey, look, if I have one big payout, even though I could be in the hole or, or haven't made much money at all, I'm going to have this huge tax burden to the state of West Virginia. Most states. Um, do it the way the federal government does. This bill only puts us in line with the federal government as it relates to tax on gambling winnings. Gotcha. I don't think any winnings other than what you've had to work for should be taxed. I don't think stock market proceeds should be taxed. I don't think gambling winnings should be taxed. I don't think lottery winnings should be taxed. You've already taken enough of my money from my hard-earned work. Let me have a little fun with my money and enjoy it, for goodness sake, without putting your claws in it. I don't mean that specifically at you, Jason. The sure. state tax cut of it is a lot less than the federal tax cut of it. You know, one of the things, Rob, that you just made me think of something as you were saying that one of the things that surprised me about the Friday show, and I listened to that on my way home uh, last Friday, is that the conservatives in the room uh, were opposed to a larger tax cut in personal income tax uh, and opposed to consumption tax, which is usually what conservatives support. So. Interesting, wasn't it? Yeah, I cut that too. And Mike, Mike Carl's a big consumption tax guy. Right, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. So yeah. But maybe, uh, maybe he's unaware of, maybe he just didn't have the details on how much consumer sales tax brings in and, and what the offset was. It's, it's the same tax, same tax cut uh, across the board, 750 million. You've discussed SB 464 already with the correctional officer's locality pay. SB 457, removing certain activities, alcohol, beverage, control commission licensee is prohibited to permit on a private club premises. Yeah, that one is kind of a, a local thing, actually. Um, the ABC, there is a, some overzealous um, uh, 
enforcement agents with ABC, specifically in our area, our area, and, and really in other states, in other counties as well, other areas of the state as well. Um, and uh, the, the ABC has the ability to enforce alcohol laws as they should. Uh, there are a few other things in code that they can do, lewd behavior, disturbing the peace, and that kind of stuff if they're in a, an establishment and see that type of behavior. Uh, but gambling was also included uh, in code several years ago, and that was before um, a lot of the lottery products were available uh, and legal. Uh, really, they were in that that section of code, I believe, or that that, that small one word gambling in code was really aimed at the old gray machines, the old illegal slot machines. Um, but now uh, there are different raffles and charitable raffles that are done through the tax office that the ABC um, thinks that it's their job to enforce, um, and it's not. So and I, well, I'm trying to make it not. Uh, and it's, this, this is something that fraternal organizations deal with, um, local uh, private clubs deal with, uh, and it's really just, you know, the, what I've told the ABC is that they're not the West Virginia State Police. They are the Alcohol uh, Beverage Control Commission, uh, and they should be enforcing things like underage drinking and uh, over-serving uh, an establishment. Yeah. Uh, Jason, going back quickly to the income tax, uh, Ken Apple was on yesterday, and Ken made the point that in t past time uh, discussion of tax reform, we were talking about such things as getting rid of the tax penalty, uh, excuse me, the marriage penalty and others. Now, I think all I'm hearing is just the 50% tax reduction. Is there, given, is, there, is there some discussion being done to overhaul the uh, tax code that would eliminate this marriage penalty and things Wait. similar to it? Um, I was in a meeting this morning starting at 7.30, and we discussed the marriage penalty uh, as it relates to personal income tax. Okay. So, again, that, that's a benefit of, of taking your time and doing it right and not um, rushing it out right away to help a particular Senate campaign. Which uh, part of a discussion we had earlier this morning, in that if you go back, obviously it goes back quite a long time because I know Mike Carl wrote an original tax <laughs> overhaul plan for the state many years ago. Fair 55. And, and that was the more recent yep. one from about, what, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. if not sooner. But the emphasis was on when we get in the position that we can, we're going to do overall tax reform. And we thought we were going to go down that road. But then all of a sudden, this gigantic surplus hit us like a semi. And it became more about tax cuts as opposed to overall tax reform in the state. And things like the marriage penalty have been totally forgotten about and sort of swept into silence. I'm glad to hear you say that you folks were discussing that in committee. Can you tell me how those discussions went? Well, it wasn't in committee. It was in caucus. Caucus, so, sorry. No, I can't really tell you about that. But, but it's something that's on our radar and we're looking at um, as we move forward with personal income tax reduction. And how about some of the other nuances in the tax code, like the $60,000 top-end limit right now, which has been in place for 25 years, adjusted for inflation, would be like $128,000 now? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's something that you know, we've kicked around the idea of, of changing the tax brackets a little bit. Um, you know, like South Carolina, for example, I believe their top tax bracket is less than $20,000. Um, and, and they have the exact same problem where they haven't adjusted it for inflation. So... Um, you know, I think it just depends on, do you think that the state, you know, when you reduce personal income tax down to three and a quarter percent, which could be close to what our top rate would be, um, you know, at that point, should it just be flat or do you need to change the brackets and, and stagger by a quarter of a point? Does it really make that much difference? Probably not. Jason, again, shifting subject, my apologies. Yeah, uh, you have a minute to shift, Bill. Okay, uh, DHHR, uh, with a lot of talk going down there, what's, what's moving on that front? So uh, we are, uh, again, I'm chair of subcommittee A, which deals with DHHR and finance. We are working to provide more transparency uh, to the DHHR's budget uh, so that we have a little more control and understanding as to where their money is being spent. Uh, DHHR was, uh, they brought their uh, 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 budget presentation to Senate Finance the other day. Uh, they are implementing some locality pay uh, as it relates to CPS, uh, youth services. Um, and I pushed them a little bit on why not um, all employees uh, in DHHR. Um, all these positions are hard to fill. Uh, we have a problem recruiting um, and retaining uh, DHHR employees across the board in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, and you know they tried to 
tried to say that it wasn't an area of need, and, and I know better than that. So I'm moving forward with a locality pay bill that's going to, uh, th that would um, require uh, every state agency to develop and implement a locality pay plan. All right, Jason, final word is yours. We're down to just a few seconds here. Well, I appreciate the opportunity as always. Um, uh, it, it's a lot of work. I'm enjoying it. Um, we're, we're moving forward. Uh, we have not. I know there's, I, I read the comments on the Facebook feed. Everybody wants the tax cut done. We're, we're, we're working on it. Uh, we'll have a plan that's sent back over to the House. Uh, we're going to continue negotiations. Um, but when you do these things right, uh, you, we can do it right or we can do it quickly. And my, my choice would be to do it right. Jason, thank you very much.